Oh, I see. There are a lot of questions in here, and mm. well, mm. <laughs> well, I I'm beginning to feel <coughs> I'm beginning to feel a little sad because I think the time is coming soon that we will be. Um, departing, I, I suppose you're all going tomorrow? Some of you probably will be here, but some of you will be gone. And, um, but it has been a marvelous time. I, I really have enjoyed every minute of it, I must say, being with the friends. And let, me disc let, let us go straight away into the subject we, start, we, we were talking, it was about teaching, if you remember. And uh, I was explaining that uh, one of our problems, I believe, is that in our methods of teaching, that we have to learn. We have to learn, first of all, the difference between these two aspects of presentation of the faith. One is the giving the message and proclamation, and the other is personally teaching and confirming a soul, which is very different thing altogether. Now you see what I meant when I said that if you go into a public meeting and you begin to teach the faith, as we often do at our homes and firesides, then you could in fact uh, say things which could put people off who are not, you do not know them. You do not know their feelings, their ideas, their backgrounds. And that what we should do is to adapt uh, whatever, adapt our talks to their um, condition by giving them those teachings which are pleasing and which are not controversial, uh, don't open up controversial subjects or theological subjects in a, when you are giving the message, but just really attract them to the cause, attract them to yourself by giving them something of the teachings which they could leave the room with it and say that was very nice. But when we're teaching the faith, well, as I mentioned, we have to do things. We have to warm up the person with the love of God. And another thing which is very important in teaching is put yourself out of it, really. <laughs> Do not, let us not bring ourselves into it. The minute you bring ourselves into it, then this becomes a barrier. We must always, whenever you teach the faith, you must never go alone. And this is one of the very basic principles. Never go alone to teach. Always bring with you Baha'u'llah. And this will enable us to then win the hearts. But Baha'u'llah, it's not always easy to bring Baha'u'llah with us. I want to also mention that. He does not come with us unless we <clears throat> let him. We must let him to come with us. And this may, you might be uh, surprised to hear this. We must let him to come with us. He cannot come otherwise. Uh, you know, uh, you see a generator of electricity, a generator. The generator is pouring its energies in the network, in the wires, pouring it. But not until you connect it up, connect up your light and your instruments to it, will it ever enter into it. It will not be able to energize it unless you let it, unless you open the way, unless you switch it on, unless you connect it to it. It is not the function of the generator to connect something to itself. Uh, if you leave a lamp beside the generator for a hundred years, the generator cannot say, well, this is uh, really pity, this lamp is sitting beside me, I better connect it to myself. This is not its function. We have to connect it. As soon as you connect it, the energies will come. And it's the same thing with Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah cannot come to us unless we open the way for him. This is a very basic principle. He says, love me that I may love thee. Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. 
Know this, O servant. This is exact words of Baha'u'llah. Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. He doesn't say, if you don't love me, I don't love you. He says, if you don't love me, my love cannot reach you. If you have not switched on the light, he's telling us, the power cannot come through it. It's very simple. And so here is where we have to allow Baha'u'llah to come with us in all our activities, in all our services. No matter what it is we do, anything that a Baha'i does, if it wants to bring results and fruits, whether it is typing a letter, whether it is uh, building a house for the faith, whether it is making a cup of tea in the kitchen, not until we are able to attract the power of Baha'u'llah to ourselves can it ever be effective. Now, I, <laughs> I have no idea how long we can talk together, but I uh, hope sometime we can talk about this, drawing from the power of Baha'u'llah. But if there is chance, we might talk about it. If there is not, you can read the writings. And when you read the writings, the answers are there. That, uh, and, and the only thing I would like to mention here is this, that no Baha'i can be successful in anything he's doing unless and until he has Baha'u'llah with him. And as I said, he cannot come to us just like this. We have to prepare the way for him. One has to read the writings in the morning and in the evening, you know. One has to say the obligatory prayers. One has to read the history of the faith, the history of his revelation. One has to draw closer to him. And then one has to serve the faith. Very important thing that we t said, talked about it this morning. And one has to live the life so that he can come to us. But one thing that I must say here now, and this is important, and please don't forget this point. This is a very important point. God, I mentioned the first day, is very forgiving. We must not think, oh, I can't do it. I have to do all these things. I have to read the writings. I have to say the prayers. I have to teach the faith. And if I don't do that, nothing will happen. I think in the writings, you can read it yourself. You take one little step forward in the right direction in any of these things and God will come to you a thousand yards forward. We, uh, once your heart is pure and once your intentions is pure, then that is a beginning. And we must never become uh, feeling frustrated because Baha'u'llah looks upon our hearts, not upon your actions. This is another thing you must remember. He mentions himself, he says, how many a people who have been fasting day and night or days and after days, but their fasting is not acceptable unto God because probably there was not a little bit of impurities. And then he says, how many a people who have never fasted and that God accept them as if they have fasted. Everything depends on our, upon our motives and upon our intentions. And once the heart is pure, the distance between you and Baha'u'llah then is very short. Once the heart is pure, there is no distance. And someone was saying before we broke up for lunch, and I think I want to clarify this point. When we talked about we have to teach the faith every day. True. And this person thought that you must tell about the faith every day to somebody. No. You might go for a month every day out and you won't find anybody to teach. But the very fact that your motive is to teach, that is acceptable to God. You go out with the intention of teaching. You go, you make the effort. Uh, maybe for a month you're looking at the person who is your neighbor every month, every day, and you pray for him. That is in the steps in the right direction. We must not become rigidly thinking in that way uh, that you must talk about the faith to someone today. If you don't know it, you have failed. On the contrary, once we move, once the heart is moved that you want to do something for Baha'u'llah and you want to give an hour for him and you go out and even if it's like that woman who went there every day, sat there, said nothing. Now that was marvelous. That, she did her, her work. And I think we should do the same thing. That the heart must be right, the motive must be right. Abdul Baha in one of his talks has said that um, if a person um, 
has, say for instance, a person is very poor, but his heart wants uh, and begs God to give him money so that he could build a house of worship. He says, oh uh, God, I love to have build a house of worship. If I had money, I would pay all the cost of building a house of worship for God. Uh, Abdul Baha says, this poor man, even if he doesn't get the money to build a house of worship, God will accept from him as if he has built a house of worship because his intentions are pure. This is what God goes by. And then he says, should he ever God give him the money and uh, build a house of worship? Well, that's very meritorious now. Imagine he, he builds it. But there is a possibility, he said, that God will not accept it from him as much as in the, in the former case, because he might, he might one day say, I built this, and then that's finished. You bring I into it, it'll be finished, <laughs> really and truly. There is no room for I in the faith. Remember this also, the faith does not harbor egotistical personality. It is, and this is why um, the authority, the authority is left in the hands of institutions of the faith. The elected institutions of the faith have the authority. The local assembly has an authority to decide, to make a decision. No one else has the right to make a decision or to give... give. Now, uh, I, now, I can mention this to you in here, for example, that uh, we have, as you know, in the faith, two uh, types of institutions, the elected and the appointed institutions. The authority is with the elected institutions of the faith. The other institutions of the faith, which is that of the councillors and the board members and so forth, and the assistants, they have no authority. Uh, they have a sacred function, but no authority. The authority lists with the institutions of the faith, and that we all will obey those author that authority. So you see, individuals, uh, are cut off here. And this is one of the blessings which enables us all to vie with each other in servitude. In servitude. Abdul Baha says that it is not possible to serve God uh, because God is exalted above our service. He says if you want to serve God, you will have to serve the friends of God, the beloved of God, the friends, the believers. And this is, I think, uh, this is why Abdul Baha says, this is the thing which I feel is the most beautiful thing he has said for all of us as a guide, as a lesson. He says, make me as a dust in the pathway of thy loved ones. And the loved ones of God is the person who um, may not have any knowledge, may not have any understanding of the faith as much as you have or I have. But he is the loved ones of God, just the believer who says, I believe, and he or she um, becomes a Baha'i and throws herself into the cause of God. And as I said this morning, we look into each other's faces and we see a beautiful sign of Baha'u'llah, and that is the loved ones of God. So friends, these points that uh, are very important in teaching. Now, I'm not going to talk any much more about teaching and how to teach the faith and how important it is. You all know this. But I would say that if you wanted to forget everything that I have said uh, this weekend, you can forget all of these things that I have said. Remember one thing. Uh, no, remember two things. Or three things, huh? <laughs> Two or three things, four things. Um, <laughs> one thing is, remember this, we must always draw nearer to Baha'u'llah, closer to him, bring him with us in everything we do, turn to him with a pure heart. And if we can't do it, I think the first step to it is to read the writings in the morning and in the evening. And then serve the faith. Just don't read it and sit there, but then serve, then go out, then do something. Give an hour to Baha'u'llah, and then things will change. Things will change. So one of the, talking about teaching again, I wanted to mention another aspect. Teaching, 
So you can see the difference which exists between teaching and proclamation of the faith, which are really for different purposes. The proclamation of the faith is designed to bring the faith into the notice of the public and give it prestige. Teaching is to confirm people. Personal teaching is to confirm people for the purpose of confirmation. Although both of them help people to, to recognize Baha'u'llah, but to, uh, to, to carry them out, there are two different functions. And uh, so where is the place for teaching? Let us find out. Where is the place for teaching for a believer? The place for teaching is in your hometown. Because that's where you can make friends. If you want to proclaim the faith, well, you might travel around. You can go here and there. But that's not, you cannot teach there, really. If you want to teach, you have to spend time to make friends uh, with your workmates, with your neighbors, with your fellow beings, human beings in the town, that you come in touch with them. And so, the place to teach the faith is in your own town. But unfortunately, again, there is another, well, misconception, if you like to say, that some people I know in Europe think that if they want to teach the faith, they have to leave their town and go to another town, and they call it travel teaching. <laughs> now, it's all right. I'm not ever, don't take it that I'm saying against travel teaching. It's really, you're, you, in travel teaching, you can do something. You can help the believers in that locality. You can go there into the streets in that town and tell the people and give the message to the people. You can give the message. In travel teaching, you can give the message of Baha'u'llah to people. But it is not easy to teach them because you don't know them. You are not having a home there to attract them to yourself. Also, you must remember, it's possible, of course, it's possible that you come across a person straightforward. You, you, you must also remember this, who is so open, who wants to know about the faith. There you don't have to wait to make friends with him. He's already friends with you. He says, tell me about the faith. I want to know about it. Then you invite him to your home. And then you don't rush into telling him everything. Just find out what he believes in. Let him say it. This is very important. Let him say things. Baha'u'llah once said that, look at the master. He's an example, he said. When, he, when somebody to, uh, comes to him, the master first listens to him. And he listens with such genuine interest that the person thinks that Abdul Baha is learning from him an awful lot. And he says he lets him say a lot of things. And at the end of it, he then says something to him in a way that the person realizes that he is not trying to argue with him. Because if a person knows that you are trying to establish in a conversation the ascendancy of your argument, if he ever thinks that you are trying to establish that you are right, and he says something and you say, no, 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 it's like this, and he keeps on saying something and you keep on, as I said, it's like a football match, then this becomes an argument. Then he, there is a barrier already. Baha'u'llah says we must not build barriers when we are teaching the faith. If ever the person thinks that you want to establish the fact that you are right, then he is going to have a psychological barrier there. He won't come to hear you. And even whatever you say it goes over his head. He's not responsive. And he says, look at the master. He listens. He listens with such genuine care. And then when his turn comes, he does not, he just says one or two little things in such a way that the person becomes affected by it. And he says, yes, this is a different point of view. And he, he, he does not rebel against it. There is no barrier. I have seen uh, that in some gatherings, when people are teaching, I've seen many people who are in firesides or public meetings, they teach the faith. And all they're interested to do, quite frankly, now I'm not criticizing anybody, but I think I've seen this, that all they're trying to do is to pour out their knowledge and impress the person with all the things they know and all the um, terminologies they know to use, you know. And they pour out so much from beginning to the end, my hour, it speaks about an hour maybe, or two, pouring out every knowledge he has. Well, this is, I think, not going to impress people. People will take it, may go home, and they may not come to you. But to attract somebody is when you give him the message with the spirit of humility. Very important, with the spirit of humility, 
Uh, again, remember, when Baha'u'llah is with you, you can do it. But if you are alone, you can't do it. If you don't take Baha'u'llah with you, then you are going to become yourself and project yourself and your knowledge and all the rest of it. But when he is with you, one becomes very humble. Now, teaching is very important and time is very short for us, really. I, I mentioned this because the world conditions will make it imperative for us that we should now really go out and teach. Now, I believe that if every Baha'i takes to heart this suggestion that I made in here to you, that one hour a day you give to Baha'u'llah, in your own ways, devise your own ways, and personal teaching need not be done alone. You can do two or three of you can gang together and teach. <laughs> really. Because often when you are two or three together, you can help. Somebody can open his home. Somebody can make a cup of tea. Somebody can talk. Work together. But there is no need to organize yourself through committees. But just go two or three people together and do this personal teaching. And I know that in this community, in your country, people are very open. They are not like Europeans who are so closed, reserved, who are having so many uh, traditions that they must observe. This nation is very free. And you have some beautiful natives here, which I say, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to see them. I would have loved to see uh, the natives. And I've seen one or two people here and to me, uh, they have a tremendous station in the faith. They are the people who have been under pressure and oppression. And the faith is going to bring them up into the open and give them. They are like little flowers which have been growing in the shade. Now the son of Baha'u'llah is going to shine on them and make them very beautiful people. And you have this crowd amongst yourselves. And I believe that if all of us together determined to give one, two, three hours a day to Baha'u'llah for teaching actively. Go out and if nothing happens, come home again. You've done your job. Just like that woman. And then put your trust. Another thing you can do, you can test Baha'u'llah. Try him. See what he'll do to you. <laughs> <laughs> really, put him on the spot. <coughs> put him on the spot. Baha'u'llah says, if you arise, I will assist you. Take his word on its face value. I have seen some people who have done this, and they come back and they said it works. Shoghi Effendi says, let those who doubt, let them try. Well, you try this. Bring Baha'u'llah with you. Do all the little things we said. Or not the little things, but the important things. Uh, those points that have been talking here since yesterday. Put them into practice for a while, and then do this. And the whole community will, will begin to become a new force. And I know that you are very blessed to have here marvelous institution of the counselors, a marvelous person who is here working with you, and the board members, who also are the embodiments of uh, really detachment and love for you all. And what I've heard, they're so loved by the friends, that you have got every, everything to your uh, advantage. When I said time is very short, I'll tell you a story here to just remind you of it. This is a Persian story again. And uh, in order to tell you the story, I have to first bring you up to some ideas that you may not be familiar with. Some In Islam, uh, it is said that on the day of judgment, <laughs> on the day of judgment, they are going to stretch, a, going to have a big bridge set up. God will establish a huge bridge Long bridge, which is 70,000 miles or something long. And they say it is sharper than the sword. And it is hotter than fire. And it is thinner than a hair. Than a hair. And you have to walk on this. <laughs> Why would you like that? <laughs> and if you ever fall, if you've had it, you go down. You see? <laughs> the fires will consume you right away. <laughs> But if you could go the 70,000 miles on a, thing, on a journey like this, which is um, as sharp as the sword, as hot as the fire, and as thin as the hair, then you're all right. 
and they say that everyone must pass through this when the day comes. Well, the story begins in here that there was a man who was a holy man and he was a marvelous person and he used to teach the faith and, and live the life in accordance with the teachings of Islam. But next door to him was a man who was really uh, the opposite. He was a man of vices and full of, uh, full of vices. And in Islam, it is a commandment that every individual must tell, if you are a good man, you must help the bad man to live a good life. You have a right to go and tell him, why do you live like this? Come and live like me, for instance. Well, of course, this is forbidden in the faith, you know that. It's a good thing, otherwise we would be talking to each other quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this man one night had a dream. This holy man had a dream one night. He dreamt that uh, the day of judgment had come and this huge, long uh, bridge was set and people were being questioned and then they put on this, um, on this bridge and they had to go. And they, this man, of course, being a holy man and have lived his life all in accordance with the teachings of God, he had no trouble. He said, I went on this bridge like anything, just like walking in the big highway. For him, there was nothing. He went on. And uh, he found this is great. Oh, it's a marvelous thing. I've lived a good life now. I'm now getting the results. And I go on this bridge so easily. No problem. Suddenly, as he was going along, he saw somebody pull the back of his coat to stop him. And of course, you know what happens if on such a bridge so, sh so thin, if somebody pushes you a little bit, you're going to fall down. He looked back. He said, what are you doing to me? Who are you? And he saw it was his neighbor. You know, that bad neighbor, that bad man. He said, why do you do this to me? He said, where are you going? Oh, he said, I'm going to heaven. I've lived a good life. Oh, he said, that's what you think. I am not letting you go to, the he to heaven. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you help me when, I was, uh, when you were my neighbor? Do you think I'm going to let you there or no? And he's, he pulled him down and the two of them went down and the fires consumed them. That was the end of him. And he woke up. And he woke up and he realized the significance of this dream. And in the middle of night, he woke up his wife and he said, this is what I've dreamt. I should have helped this man next door to me. I should have taught him the faith and helped him. And so he put on his coat in his clothes, in the middle of night, to go and tell him. His wife said, why are you doing it now? Just wait till tomorrow morning. <laughs> he said, how do I know I'm going to live till tomorrow morning? <laughs> I have no time. I must tell him. Now, I think this is really a very good story for us. And someone described hell being in the next life, when all our friends come to us and they tell us, why didn't you tell me? That will be hell. And I feel that this is true. We must really uh, arise and tell everyone who comes across, anyone, anyone we see, we must give him the message, really. And then we must attract them to ourselves to teach them. There are two stages, you see. Attracting, giving him the message and attracting him and gradually teaching him the faith. We must not be in the habit of wanting things to happen instantly. You see, we are so much living in a world of instant things, you know, instant coffee, instant potatoes, instant things. You press the button and you think, of course, in America here, it's like this, is it? You press the button and things will happen for you. Now, you cannot have instant Baha'is. You have to teach them, you have to spend time with them. That's why Abdul Baha says at least one person in a year you can bring into the faith. I remember, I'll tell you one story here, and uh, just to give you an idea of how uh, one has to be, uh, one teaches the faith with great wisdom. You have to use wisdom here. Now, in Ireland, when we, where we live, people are really devoted to Christianity. They are marvelous, marvelous people uh, who have religion in their hearts, and they are attached to religion. They're mostly Catholics. Beautiful people, and they live such a life. You remember yesterday I was telling you the story of the chandeliers, the, the beautiful crystal lamp hanging? They are there. Uh, they are not lighted, but they are there. 
And once they become Baha'is, they become marvelous Baha'is. Now, um, they are very attached to their faith. And uh, you have to know how to teach them. You have to know how to teach them. If you suddenly go to them, have you heard of the Baha'i faith? Do you want me to tell you about the Baha'i faith? He runs away like as, as fast as you can think. He wouldn't want to hear it because he thinks this is something wrong. And this is very natural. You have to gradually cultivate them. We had a neighbor a few houses away. And my wife was very fond of her. And we were very fond of this woman. And we really began to pray for her. We thought this would be lovely if she becomes a Baha'i. But she was a very staunch Catholic. Her family were priests and so forth. Very staunch. So the first thing to do if you want to teach him is never tell him anything about the faith. You know? You just pray for him. And embrace him in your love, in your heart. You just pray for him. And embrace him in your love, in your heart. And we did this. We had some children and she had some children and the children were playing together. And she, this woman would come to our house and see some Baha'i articles and we, she knew we were Baha'is. She would never dare to ask a question. She was telling us. She was, I was frightened to say a word. Never. And for maybe six months or a year perhaps, not a mention was made of anything to do with the faith. We certainly weren't going to do it, but we knew that one day she's going to do something. And she was so agitated, she was telling us, she was agitating in her heart. Many a time she had come to ask us something, and she was frightened, and then she didn't. Now you won't know these things unless you are a staunch Roman Catholic. Beautiful people, beautiful. So one day, after a long time, she brought herself to the point of asking my wife, how do you teach your children? What is the principles that you teach your children with? She wanted to know, bringing up children. Well, that's a good subject. And we knew that if she ever, we had, we had talked about it together, and my wife knew this, that if she ever asks a question, we are not going to answer her in the first time. So my wife said, oh, yes, yes, well, sometime I'll tell you. It's very important. You see, this is the wisdom of handling these people. If we just suddenly go to him and, oh, gosh, yes, I'll tell you all about it, he's gone. No, we'll tell you about it. Very casual. And after about a month or so, we knew she's going to bring it up again. And it came up eventually that, oh, well, what about that thing you were going to tell me? Oh, yes, yes, I forgot about it. All right. <laughs> and so... Eventually, we, we, she talked to him a little bit, not about the faith so much, but about the principles of child education as Baha'is, we know it. And then she said that she was frightened after that. She told us. She, she wouldn't come and ask us anymore, and we knew this would happen. She wouldn't come near us again for a good while. But then she couldn't help it again. And eventually, I'll make it very short for you, she came and she asked this time about the faith. And there again, we knew we are not going to tell her right away. Oh, no. Well, my wife said, oh, yes, well, I'll tell you sometime. <laughs> sometime I'll tell you about it. And then when the next time came, and after a while, all we gave her was a prayer book. Just give her a prayer book. That's the best thing you can give to a Roman Catholic as an introduction to the faith. And she said that when she, received, she got this prayer book and she read some of the prayers, she couldn't sleep that night. And then she hid the prayer book away from her sight. You see, this is a very good thing that's happening. Uh, the forces are entering within her and the reactions are building up. Obviously, it's being affected already. And we knew that this will happen. And gradually, gradually, she comes forward. And she came and she asked, and then my wife told her about the faith in greater detail, uh, gradually and gently, and gave her to read some of the writings. And so she almost was a Baha'i. And then, I'll tell you something that you must know, that, you know, in teaching the faith, uh, Shoghi Effendi mentions that, you read the advent of divine justice. He tells us, he makes us to understand that it is not wise always. Now, this is not, mind you, a universal law, but it is very helpful in many cases, that when you're teaching the faith to somebody, 
You must teach him yourself and your friends. That's all right. Bring your friends to help. But you don't have necessarily to show him to the Baha'i community. Because the Baha'i community may have some Baha'is in them who by virtue, say for instance in this country or in America, I don't know what it is, I hear there's a lot of race prejudices in America. Isn't that right? I hear that. Well, supposing you have a man, you are teaching him and he's white. And he's coming close to the faith or somehow you're teaching him the faith and say, now let's go and see the Baha'i community. And then he sees all of them sitting there. They are all colored. Well, he's going to run away because he has prejudices. He's not a Baha'i yet. You see now? The prejudices that he has has not yet gone. So we must not give them tests, unnecessary tests. And this is why Shavu Effendi says that when you teach the faith, you have to teach it with wisdom. You have to be sure who is going to be the right person to meet with that bad person because he's in these early stages. And so this lady uh, had reached the point that she said, now I want to come to one of your meetings to hear about it. And she said, if I could be the one who would be speaking. So I said, all right, well, if she wants me to speak, let us arrange a meeting in some Irish friend's home and invite two or three Baha'is and then I'll go and uh, we can talk. So the night was set and half an hour before we were due to leave to go to this house because by then we have moved our residence from there. The, the, the host telephoned and said, you know, the house is full of people and a lot of Persians and others have come. They have heard that I was going <laughs> and the whole house is full. Now, I knew this is bad for this lady. If she now comes up and sees this Baha'i community, the way we are consisting of so many different backgrounds, she is going to probably go through a great unnecessary tests. So I, uh, well, I'll tell you what I did. I, I had an excuse not to go that night. And we canceled the meeting. Uh, we arranged it some other night. These things are uh, hints that you should we should bear in mind, because people have prejudices, they are not ready. Of course, now she's a marvelous Baha'i, beautiful Baha'i. And all these stages are past. You see, in England, for instance, there is a great deal of class distinction. In here, you don't have probably class distinction, you have color distinction. And the class prejudice is so, such a subtle thing we have no English people amongst us, have we? I can say some things about them, can I? <laughs> you know, the English people, uh, all you have to do is to talk. Just talk. Or sometimes even my wife says there is no need to talk. You look at them and you know which class he belongs to. The way he looks, the way he sits, the way he looks at you. But as soon as he talks, definitely you know which class he belongs to. And then there is a barrier between the two. The barrier is so subtle that it doesn't show it. It's very polite and smiling at each other, but it's in the underneath, you can see through the smile, you can see a lot of barriers there right away. This is a great deal of prejudice there in that way. Now, I remember we had a marvelous Baha'i teacher, uh, Kathleen Hornell. She's passed away, a beautiful person, Lady Hornell. She was a titled woman. And uh, Lady Hornell was great wise teacher of the faith. And she had some uh, people she was teaching in her home. Uh, but she never mixed up her, uh, her, her, her contacts. The people she was teaching, she did not mix them up. She mixed them up in accordance with their class, shall we say. She was teaching a, a lady of high class, of a high society, very, very distinguished lady. And then she was teaching some of the laborers, dockers, she never let them see each other until they became Baha'i. I remember one day I was there, and uh, this lady was there, Lady Ornell was there, and I was there, and some others were there, and we were talking about the faith. And um, this lady, she was teaching, Elizabeth Greaves, if any of you have ever heard her name. She was a marvelous woman. She's passed away. She became a beautiful Baha'i. She belonged to a higher society. Now, that night was her night. T tomorrow night was the night of the others. 
And I was sitting in the room and I suddenly saw behind the window walking John, who was, a, who was one of the dockers, you know. And he had decided tonight he had nothing to do and he thought, although it wasn't his night, but he thought he'll come tonight and drop in and see what Lady Honor is doing. Well, as soon as I said to Lady Honor, John is coming here, she got up and went to the door and said to John, she said, John, I'm very busy tonight. Would you mind to come tomorrow night? You don't mind, do you? Now you see, how many of us would think that way? Wisdom. And it was wise. If Lisbeth had seen others, this is going to be a Baha'i? Is this a Baha'i and am I going to be a Baha'i? She, hasn't, she has got still all the prejudices in her mind. She's not a Baha'i yet to give, get rid of the prejudices. And this is why I feel there are many things. You should read the advent of divine justice, really. This is a letter that Shoghi Effendi particularly wrote to the American Baha'is. After he gave us the seven-year plan to the American believers, he wrote the advent of divine justice. Now, if you read that book, it gives you all the prerequisites for teaching. It tells us how we should acquire those prerequisites, how we should have that moral, moral strength, the spiritual strength. And then he tells us some basic principles about teaching. And one of them, he says, uh, meet a person, uh, attract him to yourself, teach him the faith, make him a Baha'i, then introduce him to the Baha'i community. Now, it, as I said, this is not a general rule that you must always do this. But this is a, gu a guidance which so many times is true and right. Uh, and once we learn these things, it will help us. I think we have talked a great deal about teaching. Let us leave that subject aside. I wanted to talk about another aspect of our work. You remember we mentioned this morning that there are two basic work we have to do. Teaching is in the forefront. And of course, remember, deepening goes with teaching. Deepening and teaching are the same thing. When you become a Baha'i, you don't stop teaching yourself the faith. You keep on learning and deepening in it. And now that I'm talking about deepening, let me talk a little bit about deepening because it's a very important subject. I didn't mean to talk about this, but let us talk about a little bit about deepening. Deepening often is taken to mean that you must attend classes and uh, learn and read. But often deepening, this is one form of deepening, which is not bad, it may help to read, but I think the real deepening comes, the fruit of deepening, the sign of deepening, is when your love for Baha'u'llah increases. If you go to a study class and when you come out of it, if you find that your love is increasing, then you have deepened in the faith. But if you find only your knowledge has increased, then we must bring a balance in here. The balance is not right. Because the real deepening comes to us when we understand. In Arabic, there are two words which are very clear words and they mean two different things. One is called elm, which is knowledge, translated into knowledge. The other one is erfan. Erfan is very difficult to translate it into one word. It means understanding. Sometimes Shoghi Effendi has translated it as understanding. But it is really more than understanding. You can't just bring it in one word. It is knowledge. Erfan is knowledge plus which results in understanding, recognition, uh, penetration of uh, your thoughts into mysteries. All these things together makes it Erfan. Let us use the word in Arabic as it is, or understanding. Either we can call it understanding or Arabic. Now, the, the thing to do, the thing to learn, and knowledge is, is, is something that you acquire. You learn knowledge by reading and by studying things. And then your mind will store it like a computer. And anytime you want it, it comes out again, back to you. And... Uh, some people are very good at it. They have good memories. They act like uh, as good computers. They learn from this and learn from that and learn from the other and they add them together. They, they, they act like an encyclopedia sometimes. Well, it is good. Knowledge is very important and we must have this. But really it is not 
um, essential in a sense when you're comparing it with Erfan. The goal of life is to acquire Erfan. Erfan, let us call it understanding. And in order to acquire Erfan, Baha'u'llah has told us what we should do. Now I'm going to tell you exactly in a few minutes. But let me first say that uh, there may be people who know a great deal about the faith. They have the knowledge of the faith. There may be great scholars of the faith. They may write books about the faith. They may know anything you ask them. He tells you where it is and where to find it. But this is not a great, it's not as great. It's not a great thing as great as having Irfan. They are acting like encyclopedias, like a computer, something which has accumulated all this knowledge. And as Baha'u'llah says, they usually steal it from one another, you know, and they pride themselves in it. We have had many such people in the faith, or we have them probably, I don't know, scholars who write books, who say things, they know things. But the man who was Irfan, he may not be even educated. But you ask him anything, and it comes out of his heart. It, it wells out of the heart. The knowledge wells out of the heart of man. The knowledge of God wells out of the heart, just like a spring. Baha'u'llah has confirmed the Islamic saying that knowledge is a light which God throws in your heart. Baha'u'llah confirms this. He talks about it in the Kitab al -Iqan. Knowledge is a light which God casts in your heart. What a strange place for, for knowledge. Because often when you say this to people, people say, well, the heart is not a place for knowledge. It's the mind which is a place for knowledge. And it is true. But how can the knowledge of God be cast in the heart of man? And this is what is the difference between knowledge, ilm, and irfan. Irfan, which is the recognition, which is the understanding, comes to the heart of man, and then the mind will pick it up and understand it. But it dawns in your heart, because Baha'u'llah says, your heart is the place, is my home. I'm paraphrasing it. He says, your heart is where I will come into it. He will not come into your mind, he'll come into your heart first. Heart is a place of love and warmth. We have two focal points in our, in our bodies. One is our mind, which is the center of intellect which is very important center. We are not trying to underestimate it or undervalue it. And the other focal point is the heart of man, which is a center of love and warmth. And Baha'u'llah says that God always comes to your heart. He says, this is my home. And many a times he says in the hidden words and other tablets, he says, many a times I came to your heart, my home. I found there was a stranger in it. And then I left. And do you know who that stranger is? Ourself. Attachment to the things of this world. The most formidable form of that attachment is our own self. Attachment to our own self. The love of oneself. The ego. So, he says, I came many a time and you were not there. Or, or the heart was full of the strangers. And then I left and I went. So you see, the knowledge of God comes into our hearts. And, the, and then, then the mind will pick it up and will understand it. Now this is what we should aim for as Baha'is, for deepening. That our hearts may, be, may become the recipient of the knowledge of God. Whether we have education or not, it doesn't matter. Whether we have knowledge or not, it doesn't matter. And Baha'u'llah tells us what should we do that we may acquire this quality of Irfan, understanding. If you want to know what he has said, read the first, the opening chapter, the opening passage of the kitab i -Iqan. He says, no man, no man shall attain, I'm paraphrasing his words, no man shall attain unto the shores of the sea of, the, of, the sea of understanding. Uh, he uses the word Irfan, which is translated into understanding. It's that word he has used. No one will ever acquire to understanding. The shores of the ocean of understanding. 
unless and until. Now, if you ask the people, I want to understand, what shall I do? If you ask the people, they say, well, if you want to understand something, go to the university. Learn. Baha'u'llah doesn't say that. He says, no man shall ever attain the ocean of the knowledge of understand, of the ocean of understanding, the shores of the ocean of understanding, unless he be detached from all that is in heaven and on earth. You see the, qual the condition he has put down for it? And detachment, we talked about it this morning, what it means. If you are in love with Baha'u'llah, your heart will become open. And then, uh, anything you want to know is there. Believe, it. Believe you me, I've seen the early believers who were illiterates. And uh, this is the history of our faith. And their understanding understanding of the faith was so deep it gush it gushes out of their heart we have seen two types of learned people if you like to call it one who had knowledge oh yes great learned men and they come along and give talks to you and discuss a lot of things and theories and all sorts of ideas and books and writers and everything you like and then there is a man who may be illiterate uh, who has got this great understanding of the faith. Now, the other man may not have understood the faith. He has the knowledge of the faith, but he has not necessarily understood the faith. And this is why some of them leave the faith after becoming scholars. We have had so many scholars who have left the faith because he doesn't understand the faith. To understand the faith, we have to really go closer to Baha'u'llah. To the extent that you go nearer to him and closer to him, uh, and this means you become detached, then your heart becomes the dawning place of the knowledge of God. Somebody uh, came to me a few years ago and he said that I have been a Baha'i for 10 years and I have read many things. I have accepted everything Baha'u'llah has said, but he said one thing I cannot accept. And he told me one of the writings of Baha'u'llah, he said, I can never accept that. And he said, I've asked many people to explain to me uh, the wisdom of this, but nobody has been able to explain it to me. Can you tell me what is the wisdom of this? Because he said, I can never accept that. Well, here it is now, a problem. I said to him, have you ever thought you might be wrong? <laughs> he said, no, really not. Now, you know, we have to be humble here. If you want to approach the cause, the revelation of God, you have to be humble. And I said, well, not until you are ready to accept that you may be wrong. And I, I said, now, of course, you, you believe in this. You can't say you are wrong. But at least you must be prepared to say that you are wrong. You may be wrong. You cannot understand this. You will never understand this. This, you are a believer. You believe in Baha'u'llah. There is no question about it. You know he's a manifestation of God and you know that man makes a mistake. Well, the only thing to do is to submit and say, I don't understand this. I may be wrong. I am wrong. I accept. Without recognizing it, without knowing it, you accept it. And do you know what happens? Once you accept it and you submit yourself, then one day, one day, it may be tomorrow, it may be the next month, it may be the 10 years from now, suddenly it will flush into your mind and into your heart the wisdom of that thing. And nobody can explain it to you, but it will come to you when you read the writings. Suddenly it will penetrate into your heart like an electric bolt. And then you know the wisdom of it, but not until you submit. As long as you say, oh no, I don't accept that, it will never come. So you see, friends, Studying and deepening in the faith is a spiritual experience. We have to aim for that so that our hearts become the repository of the knowledge of God. And so, as I said, I have seen many people who were illiterates, who did not have or, 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 or did not have much of a knowledge, but uh, who had such an understanding of the faith. Every time you ask them a question, even if they had never heard of that question, never heard of it in the writings, never knew what the answer was, the answer would come, and when you look into the writings, you could see this is exactly what Baha'u'llah or Abdul Baha have said. This is, this is a true deepening. 
And I feel we should aim for this more and more, all of us. Do not become, um, do not feel inferior to all these people who come to you. And I'm not in any way trying to under um, value the value of people who are learned or who have knowledge. But don't be frightened of them. Really. How you have Baha'u'llah and he will come and teach you a lot of things that these people themselves don't know it. You may come across people who go to universities years after years, and I'm not in any way saying it's bad to go to universities, but they come and they talk to you about the faith and you might be feeling inferior. Don't feel inferior. The faith is for all of us. Baha'u'llah is for everybody. The humblest person. And it is you who can know much more than he does. But of course, how wonderful it would be if knowledge and understanding are together. Oh, this is beautiful now. And this is the perfect, this is like the chandeliers, which is perfect in itself. Crystal, lovely, beautiful, exquisite lamp, but it is also lighted, you see. A person who has knowledge and understanding, has ilm and irfan, means knowledge and understanding. This is perfect. It's like Mirza Abul Faz, the great Baha'i scholar we have. He was, uh, he had both knowledge and understanding. And this is, of course, the aim. We must learn knowledge, we must acquire knowledge, but we must also turn to Baha'u'llah so that in humility, so that he may give us this gift of understanding. Well, now that we have talked about this, let me now enter into another subject. I hope I'm not making you tired, huh? Soon we will have a break, don't worry. Whenever the chairman walks down the steps, we know the time has come. I think that uh, the other thing I wanted to, 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 to bring up the subject is, you remember we said there are two major work we have to do. One is that of um, teaching the cause, which is the most important thing which we have been talking about up to now. The other thing is the building of the institutions of the faith. The institutions of the faith, which we are building now, the local assemblies and the national assemblies, these are the instruments for the future of mankind, the institutions for the future of mankind. We may not realize this yet ourselves, because we are so much uh, in the early days of the faith, and these institutions are so weak, that we may not ever think probably that, oh, this local spiritual assembly one day is going to become the house of justice for this town. House of justice, who knows? Maybe it will become something like the government of the house, of this town. But whatever it is, hello, <laughs> oh, beautiful little boy, very nice. <laughs> uh, these local spiritual assemblies one day become houses of justice for mankind for the people of this town. And we may not realize this, but at this moment that we are talking about, we are entering into a very critical age, critical time in the history of mankind. A time which we talked about again this morning is filled with, with perils and with uh, dangers and with sufferings, with tribulations, calamities. And the only thing which mankind will have uh, when the world is really has um, tasted the agony of, of this uh, whole calamities which has to come, are these institutions we are building. There is nothing else which will be left, which mankind can really have um, turned to, which would save it. And even now as we stand here, if it wasn't for the institutions of the faith, for the new life which Baha'u'llah has breathed into the world of man, the world would not be, be together. The world is keeping together today because of the existence of these institutions. It's because of the house of justice that the world is now exists the way it is and can exist. It's because of our institutions of local and national assemblies that our communities can exist. Really. 
and it is the only refuge, Shoghi Effendi mentions, of a tottering civilization. Now we must believe in these things. We are not building these assemblies for fun. There's no fun in that. <laughs> and we are not working. We are not serving on these local assemblies for fun either. Because it's a difficult job to really, main, to, to re, really go into the local assemblies and to, to act as the way we, do, we should. It's a very difficult job. Needs a lot of perseverance and labor. So you see, not until we realize the significance of these institutions. Now I have used this example before and I'm going to use it again. It's not a bad example perhaps. Some of you may have heard this. And that is an example from nature of what we have been going through, what we will be going through. I'm going to use an example of nature. In nature, uh, if you look at an egg, an egg is a perfect food for you until it is fertilized and a new life begins to grow in that egg. Once the egg is fertilized and the, and the chicken begins to grow in that egg, the food becomes corrupt, becomes rotten. You can't eat it anymore and the balance is gone inside. A new situation has arisen in that egg, within that egg. And what happens is this, that this little life begins to grow inside, surrounded by all this rotten material. And this rotten material becomes its food. And as the more this chicken grows inside the egg, the more rotten becomes the egg. These two are very related together. Until such time that these two can ne never again, the, the, the situation cannot last, the balance is gone. And then there would be an explosion. The egg breaks. And then a new life appears. It's born. And what has happened to the uh, egg and all the things in it, it's all gone. The only thing which is left behind is a broken shell. You see? This is law of life. And once the egg is fertilized, nobody can stop that process. Nobody can say, all right, now it has been fertilized and the chicken is beginning to grow, but we can stop it. You can't. Once this process starts, nobody can stop it. The same principle, it's not an example, it's a principle of life. You remember yesterday I was saying how nature teaches us a lot of things and we can learn a lot of things. One of the lessons is this thing, is this story of the egg. Now, exactly the same thing has happened with the coming of Baha'u'llah. When he came, he fertilized the egg of human society when he declared his mission. And from that moment onwards, the seed of the Baha'i community was planted. See? And from that time, from that moment onwards, the world began to deteriorate in its conditions and they, and in state, they became unstable. And the corruption set in. And the destruction set in. But it is gradual. At first, nobody could feel it. First, nobody will feel it. At first, when the chicken is just, when the egg is fertilized, you wouldn't see any difference. But gradually, but the process has begun. And as time goes on, as the faith grows, as the institutions of the faith grow, as the Baha'i community grows, along with it, the world conditions will deteriorate. And the Baha'i community, like this little chicken, is surrounded by this corrupt world. We are, we are surrounded by it and we are immersing in it and we are swimming inside it. But there is a distinction between the two. And then this condition cannot last very long. Baha'u'llah says suddenly that will happen which will cause the limbs of mankind to quake. <coughs> Time comes that this egg has to open up. And once it opens up, what is safe and sound, and the only thing which really is worth talking about, is the birth of the new, of the institutions of the faith. It will be born. People can see it. Now, it does not mean that when this happens, that the faith can run the world for us. Oh, no. When a child is born, it cannot do anything. It cannot run around, it cannot rule the town, it cannot do anything. 
that has to be years to grow, to nourish, to be nourished, to grow, to uh, then in the future when it grows up, it can take over all the things. And it's the same thing with the faith. The institutions of the faith, when this happens, when this egg breaks up, when the world situation comes to a head and that which Baha'u'llah says, referring to it as the, the limbs of mankind quaking and Shoghi Effendi calls it the calamities. When that happens, all that will happen is that the institutions of the faith will show themselves to the world. They will emerge. It's like a mother who is pregnant. Nobody can see the child. You go outside into the world and talk to the people about the, um, about the institutions of the faith, what we are building local assemblies, they are the foundations of the future society. They think you are a little bit, well, they don't understand this. But when, not until that child is born, not until it's born can people see and then they realize what we are talking about. Now it is this that Baha'u'llah talks about it. When he says, then and only then will the divine standards be unfurled after the, this calamity, after the suffering. <coughs> he says, then and only then mankind can see. Then and only then they can see what these institutions that we are building are doing for mankind. And it is then that they'll turn to us in great numbers. Shoghi Effendi says these local assemblies must act and will act as beacons of light at the time of greatest peril. When the ship is drowning, the best thing for it is a beacon of light. And so we have to have these beacons of light now preparing for a time that when the time comes that these beacons will be shining. To be switched on, not switched off. So you see the significance of these institutions that we are building and how important it is that we should build more institutions. I don't know how it is in this country, but I can tell you in some countries that I am familiar with, for instance in Ireland, again I must constantly talk about Ireland, I live there anyhow. If there are 10 Baha'is in a town, we call it luxury. Nine is enough. We have to build up institutions of the faith. And one of them is going to say, now they're going to look at each other and say, these 10, and say which one of us is going to be. But one of them will go. We really have very few local assemblies, which is more than nine. There are two or three, and they're usually the capitals, or usually some people have the excuse, and they're right. Their husband is non Baha'i, the wife is non Baha'i. I was told by the chairman of the National Assembly there that 90% 90, 90 of the Baha'is of Ireland have once in their life at least pioneered, and some several times to these local communities, 90%. Now, I don't know how many people you are in here, but uh, I, I think you could make quite a few assemblies. And it all need not go long distances. You can go 10 miles out of your town and form an assembly, form a community there. These institutions, the more we have them, the more beacons of light for mankind. And this is why the House of Justice wants us to Increase these institutions. And we will, we will make more institutions. So you see the significance of the local spiritual assemblies. Um, I wonder if we should close in, in five or ten minutes, quarter past three, is it all right, Mr. Chairman? Right. Now I'm going to tell you, we're talking about local spiritual assemblies now. And I know uh, what the local spiritual assemblies are, some of them that I'm familiar with. Again, I don't know what you people are like, what your assemblies are like. Maybe you are perfect. <laughs> but uh, some local assemblies are not perfect. And, uh, and the friends feel, oh well, a local assembly is very weak. What? They become disheartened. <coughs> For instance, there may be a local assembly that there are nine people, but only six of them are really coming regularly. Oh, the other, and this is very disheartening. And they say, well, what's the use of this? What can we do about this? And then they tell them to make more of these. <laughs> this is a problem. This is a problem. You see, you have got this weak local assembly, and they tell you to make more of them. Now, I will talk about this after this session, a little bit about this. But let me give you a story of a weak local assembly, because you may have never seen a weak local assembly. <laughs> I will explain to you what it is like, just to give you an example of it. And then we close. 
And then when we come back, I want to uh, describe the, uh, real, the real significance of these institutions. I'll give you a story because I have been once years ago, we had a local spiritual assembly in Dublin. Now, this must be about 30 years ago. And in those days, the faith was in its early stages, very, very early stages. We had only a few believers in town, and they were members of the assembly. And one of them, of course, was our famous Mr. Townsend. Uh, he, you know, he was a member of the assembly. I was a member of the assembly. And then we had some others. I'll just give you an idea of what our assembly was like. You might be maybe amused by it. Well, now, and I, and I am saying these things very bravely because all these people who were members of this assembly, they're all gone to the next world. They're not going to hear me. <laughs> they're not going to hear me. <laughs> and if they hear me, I, I, they can't. You remember yesterday I was saying how the souls in the next life cannot influence us in a bad way? <laughs> They can't be angry at me. They, on the contrary, they're going to shower their blessing upon us. Yes, they're all gone. Most of them, most of them are gone. Now, you remember we had this assembly and then we had, uh, there were some Persian believers in it who knew not one word of English. They had come out from Persia and they had not been familiar to any of these standards in the Western world. It was so strange to them. They did not know one word of English. And they were insisting that uh, anything which is said in the local assembly, they must know what it was. And I had to translate it for them. You know? Every word. Now they would say, it's no use just to tell us the uh, gist of it or the briefly, but you have to tell us word by word so that we can understand this man when he's talking. That's a difficult job, you know. And if I ever wouldn't do it, they would quote verse and chapter for me that you must do it, you know. <laughs> so this was one of the things we had to have. Then we had a lady who was suffering from Parkinson's disease. And whenever she came to the meetings, we had to be very quiet and she was shaking and we often had to make her lie down, you see. And then we had a gentleman who was stone deaf, wouldn't hear a thing. <laughs> and uh, I remember my job was to, first of all, when the discussions began, I had to translate it in, into English, into, in, into Persian for the friends. And then I had to always sit beside our beautiful, wonderful Mr. Jones, who was deaf and shout into his ears what we have been saying, you see? <laughs> now imagine, this is an institution which is going to govern the whole of mankind in the future. <laughs> now how can we, if we don't, if we lose the vision of it, then you will deteriorate into a very low condition. But you must always keep the vision that this is the, this is the source of God's kingdom on earth, you see? And Mr. Jones, I had to shout at him all the time. And the minute you shouted, Doris would, <laughs> Doris would say, oh, why do you shout so much? <laughs> I remember one day we were sitting there and uh, we were discussing subject and somebody made a suggestion saying when we hold these public meetings in these hotels, you know, we used to have a public meeting in a hotel. He said, well, let us give a cup of tea to everybody. It's nice. At the end of the meeting, we'll give them a cup of tea. So I translated this for our friends. They say to give a cup of tea. They said, fine, we agree with this. Then I turned to our friend. They say that in the hotel, you should give them a cup of tea every time that the friends come. He said, I've had a cup of tea at home, not now. <laughs> you see? So I said, no, no, not in here, not in here. Oh, he said, you're not giving us a cup of tea every time you did. So having finished this, I said, no, Mr. Jones agrees. We should have a cup of tea to the Persians. Oh, no, no, but he said, you have been talking to him a long time. You must tell us what he was saying. 
all the details of it, we want to hear. You were talking to him for a long time. <laughs> now friends, this is the basis of our institutions. This is how our institutions are function. You see the weakness now? You could, you could look, if you look at it from the outside world, it is very funny and it is very insignificant. But you know, these institutions now have given birth, have matured, have given birth to a national assembly in that country. We have a national assembly. We have now 30 local assemblies, both in the north and the south of Ireland. Now the conditions have changed enormously. But in those days, it was the weakness of the institutions, it was part of the growth of the institutions. Because the faith has an organic growth. It doesn't grow up like a machine. You don't mold it into a shape and say, there it is. It's an organic machine. And when you first put the seed down into the ground, you go and see that seed. You go and unearth it. Just open up the earth and see what has happened to the seed. It's rotten. It rots under the ground. And when you look at it, you say, oh, this? Rotten. What is it going to do? But it has life. And it will grow. And it will produce a tree. And I think this is the way we should look upon our institutions. And then all these weaknesses will be overlooked. Friends, let us go and have a... What are we going to do, Mr. Chairman? Uh, we will uh, probably have a photograph or... I would love to have a photograph, yes. It would be beautiful to remind us.